Здравствуйте. Добро пожаловать. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to talk about Alexei Alexandrovich Dobrovolsky. So we have actually talked about him previously when we covered Valery Yemenov. But now we're only going to focus on Dobrovolsky. So I've been looking into Dobrovolsky now for a little bit to see what exactly to cover. And actually, there's a lot to this guy. You know, he looks like a kook. <laughs> First thing you look at him, do pardon me, uh, everybody who likes the guy. First thing you usually see is him doing a right hand salute in front of a very German <clears throat> flag, if you know what I mean. But actually, there's a lot more to this guy. I don't like doing this personally, but I'm actually just going to summarize the wiki because goddamn the wiki is good. And the reason why is, well, the book, the two books. One is a book called Lawyer's Notes by Diana Kimelitska, talking about a trial that Dobrovolsky went through, which we're going to talk about more in detail a bit later. The other book is by Victor Schernelman called Aryan Myths in the Modern World. It talks about what we already talked about in Valerie, and also what we're going to see later here with Dobrovolsky. It's the Aryan Slavic concept mixing together. He's, he's sort of writing that entire thing. The only issue is they're both in Russian. So I'm scrolling through here and it's like, mm, yeah, it's very interesting Russian. I don't understand a single word of it. But the wiki has it summarized, so I'm just going to do it through there. Not a fan, but I don't read Russian, so. Born October 13, 1938. Died May 19, 2013. Dobrovolsky from a young age was a Stalinist when he started studying. He never really completed his studies because when he was in his studies, he started writing for a newspaper called Moskovskaya Pravada. He started understanding that Stalin wasn't really this great man that he once seen. It's just a cult of personality around Stalin. So his idea was to sort of expose Stalin and remove him from the Russian people. And because of these ideas and influenced by the Hungarian Revolution, he formed something called the Russian National Socialist Party. And this idea was to overthrow communism and reviving the Russian nation. Because of this, he was sent to prison. And while in prison, he actually met some former collaborators for certain right-wing groups or anti-Bolshevik groups, such as associates of Krasnov, Shukuro, and everyone's favorite, Lasov. Weird enough, during this time, he became a monarchist. When he was released from prison in 1961, he actually got baptized by a priest, a priest named Gleb Yakunin. This priest was a freedom fighter for the Christian religion and actually converted to Christianity because of Alexander Men. He joined in 1964 the National Alliance of Russian Solidarities, which was a Russian anti-communist organization created by white immigrants. This time he was arrested, but he didn't really go through prison. He just went psychiatric treatment because something's wrong with his brain, right? In 1965, he was released from the hospital. He joined up with a newspaper called Sami Stat where he wrote about Russian people and paganism. But he wrote this in a newspaper called the Phoenix 66, which was spread all across the Eastern Bloc and to the West. And because of this, he was arrested again. And Dobrovolsky actually went through a very important trial called the Trial of the Four. Now, I'm going to talk more in detail on this later, so we're skipping it for now, but trust me, Trial of the Four is a lot of things happening here in his time there. But after, he got two years in prison, and after that he was released, and then he started joining up with Pamyat. And I talked about Pamyat before. Pamyat is the ultra-right nationalistic party. There's like anti-Christian, anti-Abrahamism in any sense. He first started joining the first branch of it, but then later he joined Valerie. Which, again, watch the other video for more information about that. But over time, he joined more and more groups. But mostly during this time, he wrote a lot about faith and religion. In 2005, he was declared extremist by various secret courts. And is on a federal list of extreme literature. So, um, hello, nice to meet you. You're going to look at this. I know it. Hello. I'm not in support of the guy. I'm just an objective observer. <laughs> but yes, he actually got into the idea of Helena Blavatsky quite a lot and started understanding the concept of the Aryan or the, of the Nordic race. Before going into all of that, let's actually start talking about the trial of the four. It was on the 11th of December 1967. The trial of Yuri Galanskov, Alexander Ginsberg, Alexei Dobrovolsky and Vera Lashkova was due to begin in Moscow. The trial was postponed, however, and only began on 8th of January, 1968. 
all four were charged under Article 70 of the RSFSR Criminal Code, anti-Soviet aggression and propaganda. Glensko was additionally charged under Article 88.1, illicit currency transactions. The four were arrested on January 1967 and spent nearly a year in Lefortovo Prison in Moscow. A violation of Article 97 of the RSFSR Criminal Procedural Code was stated that the maximum period of pre-trial detention may not exceed nine months. Yuri Galanskov was a manual worker at the State Literary Museum and a second-year student attending courses at the Historical Archives Institute. He compiled an issue of typewriting literary, collecting Phoenix 66. Galanskov poems were printed in the first Phoenix, 1961, and also circulated separately. Alexander Ginsberg was a manual work at the State Library Museum and a first-year student attending evening courses at the Historical Archives Institute. He put together a collection of material on the case of Sinovsky and Daniel, the so-called White Book, and in November 1966 sent copies to certain deputies of the USSR Supreme Soviets and to the State Security Committee of the USSR and the KGB. In 1960, Ginsberg were arrested by the KGB in connection of issuing a syntax poetry collection, but convinced under Article 196, Part 1 of the RSFSR Criminal Code, forgery documents. Ginsberg sentenced to two years in collective labor camps, a maximum term under Article 196. Dash one. He served a sentence in the camps of the Komi ASSR, Northwest Russia. In 1964, the KGB again tried to bring charge against Kingsburg under Article 70, accusing him of possession of anti Soviet literature, but the case was dismissed for lack of corpus delicti. Alexander Dobrovolsky, which is a bookbinder in the State Literary Museum, and was a first year student at the Moscow Institute of Culture. In 1957, he was sentenced under Article 58-10 of the RSFSR Criminal Code, the present Article 70, to six-year collective labor. He served the sentence in Putma in Mordovia, SSR, Volga district. Dobrovolsky was released from the camp in 1961. In 1964, he again faced criminal charges, but after a forensic psychiatric examination was pronounced insane. Schizophrenia was diagnosed, and he sent to a special psychiatric prison hospital in Leningrad. The collection, Phoenix, 1966, published by an article by Dobrovolsky on relation between knowledge and faith. Vera Lashkova worked as a typist in Moscow University and was a second-year student in the Institute of Culture. The court sentenced Yuri Galanskov to seven years imprisonment to be served in strict regiment camps Alexander Ginsberg to seven years, Alexei Dobrovolsky to two years, and Vera Lashkova to one year. The reason why I went through this in high detail is because this is very important. For the human rights and freedom of expression in the USSR, this trial was a, sort of a catalyst for that movement. This trial is hilariously bad and really goddamn funny. So the main focus was Alexander Ginsberg, and you will see a lot of... Ginsburg, if you read on the trial of the four. Ginsburg was the one with all the contact, quite a prominent dissident in the USSR, having contacts with everybody you can imagine, uh, like uh, Solzhenitsyn and many others. Now, Dobrovolsky was not liked after this trial because what he actually did during the trial was rat on the others. He didn't give a shit about the others, he only cared about his own skin. So the trial, this very important trial, was ended up being kind of ridiculous in many ways. Because of what the Bobolsky did, he just you know, he didn't care. So the defense lawyers, for example, who were there to defend Ginsburg, because they brought, the most important one was Ginsburg, and which they risked everything for, because they couldn't actually continue practicing law after this, lost it all because of a crazy schizophrenic. And can I say also, I'm, I'm the, I, I'm the, I've been going through this trial so much now. I... I've been recording this segment so many times because it's it's not ever good enough. This, I was supposed to look at the funny schizophrenic guy going crazy neo paganism. I'm stuck in a goddamn Soviet trial that keeps going and going and going. It's it's like it's so important this fucking trial and 
Why the fuck was Dobrovolsky even in this trial? What the fuck? <laughs> I am losing my mind. So if we go into his new pagan focus, even here, it's really hard to find anything written about this that's not Russian itself. So sadly, I just gotta use the wiki again. I'm not proud of it. He deducted Russian spirituality directed from Slavic heritage, closely related to his native soil. He took blood and soil literally. So in his opinion, some powerful material force emanates from the graves of the ancestors, influencing the faith of the living. As a supporter of national socialism, pagan socialism, he considered the highest value not the specific Slavs or Russian, but the Russian community. In the pre-Christian period, the Slavs allegedly did not have squads separate from the people. The Wawolski traced his concept to Russian natural peasant socialism, which reportedly included a complete social equality, equalization, division of property, voluntary self-restraint, and did not recognize the right to private property. He believed for the first time the harmonious relationship between man and animal was undermined by the introduction of animal husbandry. He blamed the Semeto Harmatis, who came from Atlantis and invented bloody sacrifices. He considered Jews to be equivalent different civilization, experiencing absolute hostility to nature, in contrast to all indigenous people of the world. In the Bible, nature is supposedly portrayed as a nursing mother but an insensitive material shell. He called the Jews parasite and fully justified a Jewish pogroms as forced people's self-defense. The Bovolsky considered the Jewish-Christian alignment from nature and the church justified of social inequality unacceptable. He wrote about the unnatural mixing of races and accused international Jewish Christianity of this crime. He viewed the Slavs as an equal race suffering from racial expression by the chosen people. Following the attitude of the German Nazis, Dobrovolsky opposed two mutual exclusive worldviews, solar life information and Pernikeus abstractism. He replaced Aryans and Semites with Slavs and hybrid Jewish Christians. The former are honest and sincere and the latter are cunning and insidious. At the same time, he borrowed the idea of the synagogue of Satan from Christian anti-Semitism, associating it with the pentagram, or five-pointed star, which is supposedly a symbol of evil and Freemasonry. The pagan Slavs were peace-loving and only Prince Vladimir allegedly introduced the commons of human sacrifice. And Christians are distinct by their bloodthirstiness. Dobrovolsky saw in the roots of the biblical punitive wars against the indigenous people of Palestine. He argued that the misanthropic racism of the chosen Jew served as a model for Christian racism and the extermination of an entire indigenous people. But you do understand where it's coming from. It's exactly what Valerie was talking about and wrote in his book as well. They believe in the same type of idea and how Christianity is flawed in that sense. And the true form for the Russian and Slavic people is through their own religion. So let's talk about that. The school that Dobrovolsky followed is called Rodneveri. And within the school of Rodneveri, there has multiple, multiple different schools. But it's based on location. You know, I've spoken before about what paganism is. It's a genetic religion based upon area and offspring. This idea existed before the USSR and even during the USSR in small, small, small groups. But sort of what Dobrovolsky did was push this narrative, sort of write about it, push it, make people understand what it is. He's not the main guy. Like the first time I read it, I thought he was like the main guy on a new revival of it. He's part of it. He's part of it, but he's not the main guy. There was two others. There were intellectuals who wrote about it. You know, he wrote about faith. And then people used that or took up the, the things that the intellectual was written about and took it to themselves. Through people like Dobrovolsky and the way he wrote, like by writing, by keeping it alive in written text, it did survive much more until the end of the era. It gives people something to read, something to understand and something to connect with using the literature. Now, there's punishment for this, but he did it and many intellectuals did and they all got punished. Now let me tell you something as well, uh, the other people are also a bit odd. They're all a bit odd, these so-called intellectuals, but it is what it is. I can go on a bit more about it, but I think at this point you get the drift. 
The man has a very different sort of history to him. He seems to be in positions where he isn't really supposed to be, but he gets there for some reason. The trial, the trial is, again, the trial is odd. And the reason why I focus so much on the trial is because the trial wasn't a small thing. It was actually influential. And then he was there. I was like, okay, there's been books written about the trial. Like, geez. So it's just, it's odd that he's there. His inspiration of the uh, his push into the Slavic faiths isn't so much on what I can find. There is a book about it in Russian. Uh, I don't have it, and I don't read Russian, so I can't do much more. I can't say much more about the faith, except what I've already told you. His, his ideas that did survive into Slavic native faiths. But I will end it here because here is where his story summarizes too. If anyone who watches this that uh, doesn't, because he's you know he's deemed as radical, this is just an objective look, uh, sort of uh, teaching people just the basics of a person, nothing more, nothing less. All right then, take care, and I'll talk to you in another video.